So times 2.30, so let's get started here. Uh, project number one is due Wednesday, February 4th. We will continue with section 1.2 today. Are there any questions before we begin? Yes. Um, on the homework, the project. Okay, the project? Yeah, um, question 2C. Okay. Are you wanting us to have a plot as well and make a comparison with the 2D? Hold on a second. So in 2B, I'm oh sorry. In 2B, you're supposed to make a plot. Yes. And in 2C, are you supposed to make a plot as well as the likelihood ratio um, confidence interval and make that comparison with the B part? Well, part B, you're making the plot for the for the pro, for the likelihood ratio interval, right? Construct construct a plot of the true confidence levels. So part B is making the plot of the, of the profile likelihood ratio, not profile, excuse me, the likelihood ratio interval, true confidence levels. Part C, when you're making the comparison, note that you already have the plots for the other intervals. So, if you want, you can remake those plots, but you don't have to. Right? Good. Because the plots would be in the book. The plots would be in the book? Yeah. Okay. So, does that answer your question? Yes. I kind of have a question that goes along with that for part B. So, we want to, which of the intervals is the best you want? Are there any general for all values? In general. So not just for that one. Well, I mean, you might say, well, some are better, let's say, for middle values of pi, some are better for yeah. larger values of pi. You know, there could be more than one conclusion that you could have, uh, not more than one conclusion, but you might conclude, you know, more than one interval would be okay in a certain situation. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I have two. There's That's two fine. Types of questions. Sure. For 2A, yep. um, do you want us to use, we use the binom.com function, or do we want us to use the code that you provide? You can use the easy. Uh, you can use the easiest, which is the binom.com, okay. but you can use the other one if you want to. Okay. Maybe I need to get this one. Uh, the other one's more just as a demonstration tool. Okay. And then for number one, when we kind of have to talk about the assumption, do you want us to talk about just the assumptions in general for this problem or do you want us to talk about where this problem might not meet the assumption? Or just a general discussion? Just a second. Let me uh, just make sure I'm used to always having my book with me. I don't today. And I probably won't. I don't know if I will in the future because I, um, I was bringing my book with me to class every day, <clears throat> and then I realized that uh, that book is kind of, kind of heavy. <laughs> and I was like, why did I make this book so large? It's like a brick carrying back and forth between my, my office and here. So OK, which, let's see, that's number three. OK, so describe the assumptions. So that's with respect to those five uh, properties. Um, and <clears throat> so I want you to discuss it with respect to the five properties. OK. Can we just list what they are or talk about how they apply to this particular? You can list them out, dis discuss how they apply to this particular problem, how there could be violations. OK, so just a general. 
So you've noticed there is one that we don't think is necessarily related to the problem. We need to just talk about it. Say that one more time, please. If there is one of the assumptions that we don't necessarily think it's related is related to the question, we still need to. Well, I mean, we, we talked about the particular assumptions or characteristics. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Um, you know, of, 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 of doing, we're using a binomial in this particular case. I want you to discuss them with relation to this problem. I would assume that that's going to cover everything that you need. You know, like the independence assumption, for example, there might be an issue there. Okay. I mean, I, I know of one that's not kind of discussed in amongst those five characteristics. Um, hopefully you can pick it out. Uh, but if you, if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> but it, it's, I think it's more indirectly related to those five characteristics. Other questions? Okay. Let's see. So we left off on page about 57. So we were doing, um, we were trying to compare two probabilities of success. So we have two groups, we have two probabilities of success, and we want to compare the two. One way is to simply take the, the difference between the two, pi 1 minus pi 2. And we looked at how one could use a, a walled confidence interval to do that. And we discussed there are problems with it. And we'll actually see some nice plots that really uh, display those problems. So it would be nice if we had some kind of alternative confidence interval uh, for pi 1 minus pi, pi 2. And, well, maybe there's not as many confidence intervals out there for pi 1 minus pi 2 as there is for pi. But there are better alternatives. In particular, Alan Agresti and Brian Caffo uh, suggests the following in 2000, which works pretty good despite its simplicity. Uh, and that is, it kind of builds upon the Agresti cool interval, which basically made an adjustment to the number of successes and number of failures to your data. So essentially for um, each of those two groups, add one success, add one failure. Then calculate the wall interval to this adjusted version of the data. So pi tilde 1 is going to be my adjusted estimator of pi. And so you notice here I have a 1 for the number of successes added to it. And then essentially I have a 1 plus 1, one success, one failure. You do a similar thing for pi tilde 2. And then you just, again, calculate the walled interval uh, with this adjustment. Notice in the variance part here, how that plus 2 pops up uh, for your sample size. So it's not too, too difficult to calculate. And what's interesting is that this adjustment, they suggested it for any confidence level. Notice how it's a little bit different than what we saw with the, excuse, excuse me, the Gresty cool interval, where that adjustment would, would change a little bit. And so what they did in their actual paper was they looked at a number of different constants that one could add and with a number of different confidence levels, and no matter what reasonable confidence level that someone would use, this um, essentially add one success and add one failure to both of those two groups um, tend to work the best. Okay, so let's look at how we can calculate it. Calculate this interval. This is in Bird.R. So if you might remember from last time, we have a contingency table that's denoted by C dot table, and actually that is the wrong one. That's for an example later. There we go. So we have this contingency table, C dot table, uh, that contains our data. And we also can calculate a pi hat table, which essentially allows you to calculate pi hat 1 and pi hat 2 as well. And so we'll put page down. I set my alpha, I pull out pi hat 1 and pi hat 2 from my pi hat dot table, um, table. 
So just to show you that indeed there's pi hat 1. And then you know, it's just a matter of putting the formula uh, or equation into the correct syntax for R. So first of all, I find my variance that I need for the wall variable. Pi hat 1 times 1 minus pi hat 1 divided by n1. So notice I take the sum of what's in row 1. I do a similar thing for group 2 to get my variance. And there's my variance. And now, again, pi hat 1 minus pi hat 2 plus the value for my standard normal times the square root of the estimated variance. Do all the math, and there's my interval. Negative 0.11 to 0 0.06. Okay, so that's the wall. Aggressive CAFL, basically it's exactly the same thing, but notice how I have plus 1s and I have plus 2s in there. So that interval ends up being negative 0.103 to 0 0.077. It's not too different, but it is some. Okay, so that's shown on page 158. Now if I were to ask you then uh, to give me an interpretation of this interval, uh, what would you say? Let's do the aggressive capital. What would be a proper way to interpret this? With 95% confidence is yeah, that's you know simple. You know you might want to say the difference between group one and group two, so because uh, that helps someone say think uh, understand that you're taking pi one minus pi two versus pi two minus pi one, um, or you can even be more specific. Another way to phrase the interpretation that especially stat students would hear in a set 883 course is that you know you would say, well, my confidence interval is negative 0.035 to 0.0778. Um, and then I would expect 95% of the time that all similarly constructed intervals would contain uh, pi 1 minus pi 2. That would be another way to interpret that using the, what's again thought of as the frequentist um, interpretation of what a confidence interval means. Okay, so if I were to do then, a, let's say, suppose I wanted to do a hypothesis test. Suppose I wanted to do something like this. So HO, uh, they're the same, the two probabilities, HA, they're different. So as I kind of already have there, you know, we see that zero is in the interval. So that means, yeah, the null hypothesis could be true. So I would say don't reject the null hypothesis. There is not sufficient evidence to indicate a difference in the two probabilities. So what does this mean in terms of the original problem, though, with the Larry Bird data? In that context of that problem, what would this mean? Independence. Well, it could be independence. You know, we wouldn't ever say, yes, they are independent, because notice... Uh, pi 1 minus pi 2 does not equal 0 for a large part of that, too. Okay? You know, only if pi 1 minus pi 2 is equal to 0 exactly, and we knew that for a fact, could you say independence? Instead, what, what, what you would say is that there's not sufficient evidence to indicate uh, that, um, uh, that there is a difference between Larry Bird's uh, probabilities of successes. Okay? So, you know, there's other ways to perform these uh, calculations. Please take a look at some of these on your own. You know, I bring these up especially because, you know, on a test uh, situation when you're taking the tests here, um, you know, often you want to do things as quickly as possible. And some of these other ways can actually be quicker than what I just showed you. I like to show maybe a little bit longer way first because it makes you sh make sure that you understand how to use the formulas. Okay? So one quick way to do this is just simply you know, plug in or create objects for W1, N1, N2, and W2. And then simply calculate your pi hats and then your intervals. Rather than, you know, typing out C dot table gets an array with such and such. Okay. Another way to do this is to use a package called prop CIs or proportions confidence intervals. Uh, there are 
functions inside there that will automatically calculate these intervals. Do note that this package does not automatically come installed with R. You will need to download it first and install it yourself. So the actual uh, function itself, um, I don't think it's the best name in the world, it's called wall2ci. And this is where you can say, here's w1, here's n1, here's w2, here's n2, specify your confidence level, and the adjust argument, which again is not necessarily intuitive, you can specify wall, where you want a walled interval. Alternatively, if you want the aggressive Kaplan interval, specify adjust it for AC. Not too difficult, but you know, I don't think it's necessarily as intuitive as it perhaps should be. Um, it's interesting, a few years ago, actually, I found a problem with their coding, and they actually were not calculating uh, those intervals correctly, and I, and I let them know about that, and now they have corrected it, fortunately. Uh, so let's talk about true confidence level. So I said, you know, you don't want to use the walled interval here. You know, all it deals with then the true confidence level. And so what I've done here is I've just simply got some plots that were in Agressi Kaffel's uh, paper. And in this paper, they looked at various values of pi 1, similar to how we were looking at various values of pi in our previous set of true confidence level plots. But then they also fixed pi 2 at 0 0.3. And this is what they get. Make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So let's look at the far left plot. This is for n1, n2 equal to 10. So obviously it's not a large sample size at all. Uh, again, pi 2 is fixed at 0.3. We have values of pi 1 on the x-axis of my plot. The y-axis is what they call coverage probability, or in other words, true confidence level. The goal was to get 95%. The dotted line is the wall. The black line is what they call the adjusted. Of course, you don't want to name it after themselves, but that black line then will be the aggressive capital. Interval. So what do you think? Which interval is better? The aggressive capital. I mean, it's obvious. Well, what's just amazing is that notice the wall interval and never even reaches 95%. Never does. But even with this small of a sample size that we get here, Gressy Capital's doing a pretty decent job. Now let's say that we increase just one of the sample sizes. Suppose we had n1 equal to 20. So you would think that, well, yeah, you're increasing some of the sample sizes, so that would mean then the wall's probably going to get better. Is it? In fact, actually, it's getting a little bit worse. And let's say we increase the, one of the sample sizes to 40. Is the wall getting any better? No. Look at Grassy Caffel. That's good. It doesn't get any better in the accuracy, but it gets better in the precision, right? It narrows it down there. In the middle. Yeah, the variability is smaller, yeah. yes. yes. But, I mean, what are we after? The true confidence level. So, you know, when I first saw these plots, I got really scared of ever using the wall interval in this kind of case, even though, you know, typically that's what's taught in an intro level course. Obviously, the aggressive careful is not, not that difficult to teach, too. Um, you know, it's just a very simple adjustment. Um, now, if I were to increase N2, N2 as well, I would expect, you know, this to start shifting up. I would expect that. I think I've done it, I think I've seen it, but I, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. Uh, but um, I've, I've played around with it a lot a lot of times, and, and uh, I, that should happen. It should go up. So don't be thinking that, yeah, it's always going to stay down there. But think, things should get better as N increases. Um, Why is this happening? Excuse me? Why is this happening? Well, it, it's, it's due to some of the same reasons that we saw with the, um, the original wall interval for um, uh, just pi itself, in terms of the sample size issues and stuff like that. Um, there is, um, in my book, there is actually a program that allows you to um, look at this in a more general format. So you can specify, let's say, whatever value of pi 2 you want, specify whatever kind of sample size you want. Um, so you can play around with it and see what happens. 
Now let's look at it in terms of the three-dimensional case. So in the notes, I, I show you one three-dimensional case. Here's the actual uh, uh, some plots from my book. <clears throat> so let's first take a look at the wall. So now, instead of fixing pi 2 at a particular value, I'm letting pi 1 and pi 2 vary from 0 to 1, both of them. So uh, here is my, let me get my pen out here. Here's my pi 2. Pi 1 is kind of hidden there, but it's, it's this axis right here. So the z-axis that we normally think in a 3D situation is the true confidence level. And since we are looking in 3D here, um, I drew a plane at 0.95 for true confidence level. Now, if the wall, and this is uh, for N, N1 and N2 equal to 10. Now, if the wall interval actually ever got up to 0.95, we would see the surface that we see down here, it would rise above here. It never does. And that just illustrates exactly what we were seeing uh, with those two-dimensional plots. Now, for the aggressive scaffold, this is what we get. So, you know, you can see it starts going down. It can, it can go down a little bit, but still it's not as bad as the wall. It can also be very conservative, too, on, on, on quite extreme values of pi. But still, I'd rather have conservativeness than liberalness. And that's why the aggressive capital is better. Any questions? Okay, page 63, then. So as I kind of alluded to, you know, there, there's a lot of other confidence intervals out there for the difference of two probabilities of, success, of successes. The Gressy Caffel is a really good interval. It's easy to use. That's why I focus on that. Another interval that's very good too is the um, uh, uh, the score interval. If you remember that Wilson interval that we saw just for pi before, it had another name. It's called the score interval. But well, one could also do what's called a score test for a hypothesis of pi 1 minus pi 2. We'll actually see that very shortly here. You could do a score test and also invert that test to do the interval. Now, why don't I talk about that particular interval here? The reason is because it's, there's not a closed form solution. So I can't write out a simple equation for it. You have to use numerical iterative methods to find the values of pi 1 pi 2 that satisfy essentially a no hypothesis. Um, and, and anyway. But there is a function that is available for it uh, in R. And I do mention it actually on page 165. It's called the diff score CI. You're welcome to use that at some point. Uh, but we're just going to focus on the um, aggressive capital interval in this class. OK, so, so let's make sure that you understand how these true confidence levels are found. Now, if you remember, when we did a confidence interval for for pi, if you remember we had a nice little formula that allowed us to find the true confidence levels. Oops. Just write it out real quick. So in this inter in this ex expression here, we took the sum over all the possible values of w, and we calculated this iw. Does anyone remember what that iw was? It was an indicator function, which basically meant, is my true value of pi inside my interval for w equals 0? Is it for w equal 1? Is it for w equal 2? And then what was the rest of this portion here? The binomial probability. In other words, this would be probability, let's say, my random variable w is equal to a particular value of w. Okay. So how about a confidence interval for pi 1 minus pi 2? How would we calculate that? How would we um, calculate the true confidence level? Previously, we looked at all possible values of w. We summed over it. So what do you think we would do first? Not 
not pi 1, pi 2, but no. What's my random variable? W's. The W's vary. So we would do this. Take the sum from W1 is equal to 0 to N1. Take the sum from W equal, I'm sorry, W2 equals 0 to N2. Okay. Now what would we do? The indicator function. Well, it's going to be a function of W1 and W2. And so what that's going to represent is, let's calculate an interval for, let's say, uh, W1 equals 0, W2 equals 0. Let's calculate that interval and check. Is my, whatever my pi 1 minus pi 2 is, is it in the interval? If it is, value of 1. If it's not, value is 0. And you just do that for all the possible values of W1 and W2. Okay? I'm going to take that times what? Think in terms of this right here. Probability of what? Pi 1 minus pi 2. Yeah, well, pi, pi, is, pi, is a, pi is a parameter, so there's no probabilities with it. W1 is a joint probability. What? Yes, they are independent, so we'll simplify that shortly. But just like this here, where I had the probability W, my random variable, is equal to a particular value that W can be, I need to do exactly the same thing here. Now with W1 and W2. Now remember, with the way that we have our contingency table set up, W1 and W2 are independent. So, just like in your first stat course where you learn, for example, if you had probability A intersect B, if A and B were independent, what would this be? Probability A times probability B. So what happens then is that this simplifies down to the probability of W1 is equal to W1 times probability W2 is equal to W2. Okay. Then what's the probability W1 is equal to the, the little W1? Well, it's just a, a binomial distribution for W1. Then do the same thing for W2, but a binomial distribution for W2. That's how you find the, the true confidence level. So one last question then about this is, how many different terms are going to exist? Oops, don't want to add. Let's reset there. Okay. How many different terms are you going to have to sum over? So here, just to make sure you understand what I meant, this sum is over how many terms? n plus 1. So how many different terms are you going to have to sum over when you do this? n1 plus n2 plus 2? go. So in that last example when we had n1 equal 10, n2 equal 10, that meant we would have 121 terms. So you can imagine how quickly the number of terms that you're having to sum over can be a lot. So do you think on a test I would expect you to uh, by hand do uh, n1 equal 10 and n2 equal 10? No. I could ask you Though to you know, show me, similar to what we just did here, show me how you would find it. Maybe I would ask you, well, find me the first term. I could ask you, and this would probably want to be one of the toughest questions on, on the exam, I could actually ask you, use R and find the true confidence level. There are examples in the book corresponding how to do this, actually in R. Please make sure you take it's basically the same ideas as what we did in class for just um, confidence interval from pi. That's why I don't go over the detail here. All it is is we just simply have an additional summation term. Are there any questions? Okay. Let's uh, move on then to uh, section 1.2.3, page 164. 
So we're going to talk about um, oops, wrong file. Test for the difference of two probabilities. So we kind of already did a hypothesis test, but with a confidence interval. And typically, that's what I would always do because we have such simple parameters here. Because a confidence interval gives you essentially, a lot, I think, in most, most cases, more information than a hypothesis test would. Because you have a range, the pi 1 minus pi 2. But you have a range that goes with that confidence interval. Um, you know, with a hypothesis test, you reject or you don't reject. Okay, sure, you get a p-value, but you don't necessarily have a range of possible values of pi 1 minus pi 2. Still, though, you often see people do a formal hypothesis test with a test statistic and a p-value um, uh, when examining pi 1 minus pi 2. And so uh, here's my hypotheses, as we saw earlier, testing equals 0 versus not equals 0. That means pi 1 is equal to pi 2 or pi 1 does not equal pi 2. And here's a test statistic that one would use to do the test, or one possible test statistic. You've probably seen this test statistic, I would be surprised, in, in maybe like a steady 01 like course. And basically, all we're doing here is we're taking the observed difference, we subtract off what I hypothesize that difference to be, which is zero, because that's the null hypothesis. And we, did, and we divide by here what might look a little bit unfamiliar at first. And all this is is just essentially, in the end, the estimated variance for pi hat 1 minus pi 2 um, if the null hypothesis was true. Okay. Well, if, if the null hypothesis wasn't true, you wanted to get this variance. We have already saw that when we did the, conf uh, did the Wald conference interval. If you remember, it was pi hat 1 times 1 minus pi hat 1 over n1 um, plus pi hat 2 times 1 minus pi hat 2 in right over n2. Okay. Now, in order to incorporate the null hypothesis, that basically means that pi 1 and pi 2 are equal. So if I want to estimate pi 1 and pi 2, assuming that they're equal, the best way to make that estimate then is simply take your total number of successes divided by your total number of trials. So in other words, in that contingency table then, let's go back again. So all I'm doing is, is just taking this guy divided by this guy. Because the null hypothesis is supposed to be true. So let's take advantage of that and just combine these two groups. So that's what I call my pi bar in my notes. Oops. So look what happens then if I have these pi hat ones and I replace them all with pi bars. Well, I got exactly the same numerator for both of those expressions. I can factor out that, as I do here, and then I'm left with then 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. This is actually called a score test, similar to what we saw before. Are there any questions about the origin of this test statistic? Again, that could be a, like a short answer question on a test. Tell me, how does this test statistic actually come about? Okay, similar to what I just told you now. Why do we use this? Okay. Um, are there any problems with unequal sample sizes for the test statistic? Well, I mean, you know, look, look where the sample size is. Now, obviously, though, you know, when you're calculating this pi bar there, you know, if you do have quite different sample sizes for the two groups, obviously one group is going to be um, more heavily weighted in there than the other group. 
It is the MLE under the null hypothesis. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm not following what you're saying. Maybe pi bar is the MLE assuming the null hypothesis is true. I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily important here, but that's what it is. Because what does the null hypothesis say? Pi 1 and pi 2 are the same. And with our binomial distribution, then, uh, essentially, uh, um, essentially equivalent. With, obviously, you have to worry about what n1 and n2 are, but essentially equivalent. And so if you actually set up the likelihood function, um, when you would, would do the maximum likelihood estimation, you replace pi 1 and pi 2. With just let's say pi. Do the and if you do the maximum likelihood estimation, you get your pi. Uh, let's see. Now there's another common way to do the hypothesis. And I, I'm sorry, I should say. So how do you decide if you reject or not? Well, simply if the absolute value of z0 is greater than the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile from the standard normal, you reject. Well, let's think about this in an intuitive way. You know, pi hat 1 and pi hat 2, they're two estimators of the two probabilities of successes. If they're similar, then that z0 is probably going to be close to 0. If they're different, indicating, ooh, maybe there's, there's something going on here, the two probabilities of successes are different, well, if, if, if pi pi hat 1 minus pi hat 2 are different, what's going to happen? Well, then z0 is going to be, let's say, large in absolute value. So that's why we reject whenever the absolute value of z0 is greater than this quantile. Now, there's another way to do this kind of hypothesis test. It's called a Pearson chi-square test. Uh, probably you've heard of a Pearson chi-square test. It's used in a variety of different places for a number of different uh, things. And all of them have a common characteristic. And that is, um, for every cell, in a, when applied to a contingency table, such as what we have here, a 2 by 2 contingency table, you take your observed count in a table cell, and you subtract off what you would expect that observed count to be, or an estimated version of that expected count, if the null hypothesis was true. You square that difference, so it's always positive, and then you divide by the estimated expected count again. That's the general form for any Pearson chi-squared test. You do that for every single cell of your table, and then um, uh, you sum them up to get what's called the Pearson statistic. And this is what the Pearson statistic looks like. So remember we have two different columns to our table. So that's why I'm going to sum over two columns. Now the form of this, if you've seen this test before, the statistic itself might look a little bit strange, but it is exactly the same as you've seen before. Now for row one, I'm sorry, not row one, excuse me. Let's try this again. This is, I'm summing over the rows. Okay, I'm summing over the rows. For column one, And also for column two. These are the days I wish I had a Surface Pro 3 so that I get the right angle right on my Surface Pro 2. Um, so notice here, this is the number of successes. And then I'm going to subtract off what I would expect the number of successes to be if the null hypothesis was true n sub j times pi bar. Where does this come from? Well, remember, if the null hypothesis was true, the estimated probability of success would be pi bar. How many observations do I have in row j? n sub j. So if I take the number of observations in row j times what I times that estimated uh, probability of success under the null hypothesis, I get what I would expect to occur for that cell if the null hypothesis was true. If that's not clear, you know, think of it this way. Suppose my probability of success for a field goal was um, uh, 0.3. I attempt 10 field goals. How many would you expect? 
to be successful. I did three. That's essentially all I'm doing. Okay? I square it, and then I divide by that estimated expected count again. Now I do exactly the same thing for column two. Remember, column two represents the failures. How many failures do I have in row J and J minus WJ? The expected number of failures, estimated expected number of failures, is NJ times 1 minus pi bar. So let's say the null hypothesis is false. Let me do some racing here too. Let's say the null hypothesis is false. What would you expect would happen with this difference here? Would it be close to zero or far from zero? Far from zero. And then we square it, of course, it's just going to magnify that difference. And then we essentially take into account then the, um, um, you could say the, the, the counts themselves, you know, the, you know, do I have large counts, do I have small counts, by dividing by this guy here. You can actually relate this all to a Poisson distribution, if you're familiar with Poisson's, and we actually will do that later this semester. Um, and then, so if the null hypothesis was false then, then I'm going to have a lot of these terms that are large. I'm going to be summing them up. So do you think we're going to reject HO if, 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 or not reject HO if this sum is large? Reject. So what we're going to do is look for large values of x squared. If we find large values, then that tells us reject HO. Pi 1 does not equal pi 2. Well, how large is large? That's where the chi-squared distribution comes in. And so we're going to compare this to the 1 minus alpha uh, quantile from a chi-squared distribution with 1 degree of freedom. Uh, I have a question. In the sure. formula, why do we have the square, the square 10 in, in, in the numerator? Why do I have this square here? Yeah, yeah. An intuitive way to think about it is that suppose you didn't have a square there. Then the big, the, let's say, big positive differences and big negative differences would kind of cancel each other out. So um, that's why we're squaring it there to put it all, only on a positive scale. Okay? okay. There are some more mathematical reasons if you do relate this to a Poisson distribution while you're doing it. Now, one can actually simplify this expression here uh, just using some algebra. And we get that. Now, interestingly, if I were to take the square of that z0, that score statistic, I get my Pearson statistic. You can actually mathematically prove that. So the score test and the Pearson uh, chi squared, uh, the, the uh, Pearson, sorry, I want to make sure I'm using the, the right. I did say chi-square. The Pearson chi-square tests, those two statistics are exactly the same. And thus, they will always give you exactly the same result. Uh, for another reason, that is, if you've never heard this before, uh, if you square a standard normal random variable, you get a chi-square normal random variable. That's something you would prove, for example, in stat 883. So, you know, if you want to prove it to yourself, I guess I kind of do this. 1.96. Remember that is the 0.975 quantile from the uh, standard normal. You square it, you get 3.84. Okay. The 0.95 quantile of a chi-square with one degree of freedom is 3.84. Notice this 0.975 quantile there. I'm going to draw it out. Here's 0.975. Now let's also this is a normal distribution in case you can't tell. If I were to put 0 0.025 on that side as well, so the positive and negative version of uh, uh, 1.96, notice the area here is 0 0.05, which is exactly the same area as the tail there. Without going on the details. So you always get the exact same result, no matter which way you do it. Let's take a look at an example. So again, with Larry Bird, if one wanted to calculate pi bar, let's say by hand, uh, you get 0.8846. So what this is saying is, if the null hypothesis was true, this is what I would, uh, this would be the estimated uh, probability of success. 
from my table, and I can calculate, let's see, 251 divided by 285. I can also calculate, uh, let's see here. Yep. 48 divided by 53. Continue doing all the math, you get negative 0.522. Well, that's between my two critical values, or you could say that negative 0.522, take the absolute value of that, that is still less than 1.96. So I would say don't reject HO. There's not sufficient evidence to indicate that the probability of success on Larry Bird's second free throw is dependent upon what happens on the first. How can we do this in R? Fairly simple. There's a function called prop.test where I can simply put in my 2x2 two two table as the first argument, specify the confidence level that I want, and then I'm going to specify correct equal false. Um, the default is true, and what this does, it does what's called a continuity correction, which causes the test statistic to be a little bit different from, um, from what I'm calculating. Continuity corrections are really not um, needed anymore. They're, um, basically, what they were, were before was uh, ways to try to get a better distribution approximation when needed. Um, if you were ever to question distribution approximation, there are, there are all other alternatives that uh, we will discuss later in this semester. In this case, uh, trust me, we do not need to worry because we have pretty large sample sizes. And this is what I get. So R gives me actually x squared, not z sub 0. So what would be z sub 0 in this case? The square root of 0.2727, but is it positive or negative? What do you think? Here's the, what you need to look at. Is it positive or negative? Negative. Because pi hat 1 minus pi hat 2 would be negative. <coughs> Here's my p-value, 0.6015. How was that calculated? Let's make sure you see this. So let's let a random variable x have a chi-square 1 distribution. The p-value is the probability x is greater than 0.2727. That's it. So again, with the p-value, you're always looking at how extreme you are. If you remember that, uh, you got p-values down. And we can see that I'm not very extreme at all. That's why the probability is 0.6. And so therefore, I don't reject each other. Notice also that R gives you another way to calculate the Walden interval, too. One other way. I know there's a lot of different ways to do this. One other way to do the, this test that we just did, there's a function called chi-sq.test. In this particular function, you just simply put x equal c.table. You do not want a correction. And of course, you get exactly the same thing. Now, why am I showing you multiple ways to do the same thing? Well, later in the semester, when we have larger contingency tables other than two by twos, we will have to use the Pearson chi-squared test only. We won't be able to simply use that score test. Are there any questions? Okay. There's one other thing I want to mention in this little subsection, and that is suppose you wanted to do a likelihood ratio test. Remember likelihood ratio test from uh, the end of section 1.1? You could do a likelihood ratio test here too. And this is what the test statistic looks like. Well, how did this come about? So, if I were to write out my likelihood ratio statistic itself, lambda, what goes in the numerator? It's under the null hypothesis, but what exactly is in there? My, give me just the name. My likelihood function. <coughs> likelihood under HO. In fact, the maximum possible value of that likelihood function under HO. 
What goes in the denominator? Maximum of the Likert function under H O or H A or H A H O or H A. Um, and so, well, what do you think then in that denominator? I know I'm running out of room here. In that denominator, what's that Likert function going to look like? We actually saw it earlier today. We actually talked about it, kind of. It's the product of two binomials, or uh, pi 1 and, and, and a pi 2. So uh, I wish I had more room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a little arrow down here. Now what you need to do is put in the simple maximum likelihood estimates for pi 1 pi 2. So pi, pi hat 1 would be w1 divided by n1. Pi hat 2 would be w2 divided by n2. What will go in the numerator? Yeah, exactly the same thing, but you would have pi bars for all the pi's. You take negative 2 log uh, lambda, do a little bit of algebra, this is what you get. And again, you uh, similar to what we did for just a hypothesis test for pi itself, you uh, use a you can approximate the distribution with a chi square one and uh, do the test from there. I don't focus on the test too much in my book at this stage, and I'm not going to ask you a question about the Likert ratio test for this particular uh, case here. The reason being is because um, research has shown that actually uh, the previous ways to do it were, are better. Um, and in fact, what's interesting, just a little side note. Uh, so Lawrence, Lawrence is a professor, or he was probably retired now, up at Minnesota Department of Statistics. He is my academic great-grandfather. Does anybody know what I mean by that? He was a PhD, yeah. yeah, so he was my my advisor's advisor's advisor, I think. <laughs> if, if you're ever really bored someday, go to uh, do a Google search for mathematics genealogy. There's a website, I think it's hosted by like North Dakota State or something like that. And uh, if, if you're in the mathematical sciences, meaning math, computer science, and statistics, you can trace back lineage <laughs> by typing in, well, eventually when you get a PhD, by typing in your name, and you can see, you know, how far you go back. I can trace my roots all the way back to the 1600s. <laughs> now, there's, some, there's an academic researcher who just has too much time on their hands, but still, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Tukey, for example, Tukey is an academic great 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 grandfather of mine. Anyway, I think you can actually even have coasters made that shows your family tree. Okay, well, let's move on here. So let's talk about relative risk. All of you have seen relative risks, I would bet, before, but you might not have known that they're called relative risks, or maybe you didn't even know exactly what the correct interpretation would be for them. The reason why I say that is because um, relative risks are often uh, mentioned in the news media. So you'll see something as, as, as I just shown here in a very general format. So imagine, you know, you're, maybe you're watching uh, some kind of news program on TV, or maybe you're reading um, something in a, in a, in a, on, online uh, for an article, uh, and you see something like this. The researchers showed that an individual was blank times more likely to get some disease if they did this rather than doing this. So, you know, maybe something like a researcher showed that an individual was 10 times more likely to get uh, lung cancer if they smoked versus they did not smoke. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. This is called a relative risk in, 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 in a statistical context. Okay. Let's talk about why relative risks are important. 
So relative risk will allow you to compare pi 1 and pi 2, just like what we did before, uh, in terms of we were comparing pi, pi 1 minus, uh, we were comparing pi 1 pi 2 by a difference. Except for we're going to do this comparison a little bit differently. So to help motivate this, suppose you, you had the following scenario. Maybe uh, you're working with a, a, some clinical trial information, and a person was either given a drug or a placebo. So you want to know, does this new drug cause adverse reactions? And so pi 1 is the probability of success, or probability yes, <laughs> adverse reactions do occur for the drug. And suppose that probability is 0.51. For the placebo, suppose it's 0.501. And you can see if you took just the, the difference between the two, there's not a big difference at all. You know, relatively speaking, there's not a big difference at all. Notice that I use the word relatively. So compare that 0.009 to 0.501, for example. That's what I mean by relative. Now, though, suppose you have the following scenario. The probability of an adverse reaction is a lot less. 0 0.01 for the drug, 0 0.001 for the placebo. It's the same, same difference that we saw before, but that 0 0.009 is a lot better in relativeness to your probability, success probabilities, than what we had previously. Um, and so because of that, oftentimes we want to maybe emphasize that relativeness because, yeah, um, you know, if you, if you look at this and you think, you know, let's say that you are somebody who may, might be interested in the drug and you see that, you know, your, your, your chances of having an adver adverse reaction, while still small, are still a lot higher by taking the drug, relatively speaking, than the placebo that might make you think twice about taking the drug. So what the relative risk does then simply is just takes pi 1 divided by pi 2. That's it. That's all, all there is to it. We're going to denote this relative risk by RR. So on that second scenario, on that second table there, my relative risk is 10. Now let's be very careful about how we interpret this value of 10, because especially in the news media, uh, this interpretation uh, is not always done correctly. Um, and especially we will... Um, in addition to some, some of the stuff I have here, so I have a lot of interpretations that you will see in the notes, um, just to make sure you can get it right. In addition, this relative risk is often mixed up with something called the odds ratio that we briefly talked about in class before. And so sometimes in the me news media, they will be actually interpreting an odds ratio as a relative risk or vice versa, which is too bad because they are different measures. Um, so anyway, let's focus just on relative risk. So this 10 means the following. An adverse reaction is 10 times as likely for those individuals taking the drug than those individuals taking the placebo. That seems to make sense. Okay? And if I take 10 times 0 0.001, I get 0 0.01. Another way to word this is the probability of an adverse reaction is 10 times as large for those individuals taking the placebo than those individuals taking the um, I'm sorry, for those individuals taking the drug than those individuals taking the placebo. And again, it just comes down to 0 0.01 times 10 is 0 0.01. Okay? Some of the key words there is the word as. I'm making that direct comparison there. Now note the word likely in probability, at least in statistics. Uh, they essentially mean the same thing. Okay. They essentially mean the same thing. So that's why I use those two uh, uh, different words there. Here's another way that one could say it. <clears throat> An adverse reaction is nine times more likely for individuals taking the drug than those individuals taking the placebo. Again, emphasize the word more. I'm not talking about as anymore. I'm talking about how much more. Also, you can say the probability of an adverse reaction is nine times larger for individuals taking the drug than those individuals taking the placebo. My book talks about this some more, but we're going to uh, spend, spend some time here talking about this too. The differences between the wordings there. 
uh, you know, it's important to get the, the English wording correctly because you know, obviously one could make, get mixed up exactly what's meant. So one essentially uses RR and one essentially uses RR minus one. Okay. But what does, and, and here's some, some reasoning behind this. What does one times as likely mean? Well, it's equivalent to pi one divided by pi two is equal to one. I mean, the probabilities are the same. What does two times as likely mean? Well, again, what I was kind of doing on, uh, on demonstrating when I was writing now, pi one is equal to two times pi two. Now, two times more likely is equivalent to pi one divided by pi two is equal to three. That more than is what's causing the difference. I think the easiest way to think about it, to understand fully what the difference is, if it's not totally clear, is to take a look at this example. Pi one divided by pi two is one point five. That means uh, the pro that a success is fifty percent more likely for group one than group two. You agree with me on that? Fifty percent that the probability that this that essentially the uh, the probability of success is or uh, success is 50% more likely for group one than for group two. That ratio is 1.5. Alternatively, you could say a success is 1.5 times as likely for group one than group two. So I think once you start having stuff after that, that decimal, that, that, that really helps to see the difference between the two. You know, I don't care which of the, the interpretations that you use, just make sure you get it right. Okay. Now, what does a relative risk of one mean, just to make sure? It means the two probabilities are the same. Okay. What is the numerical range of the relative risk? So the bottom, poss the smallest possible values of relative risk can be, and what's the largest possible value of relative risk can be? Zero is the smallest, yes. What's the highest? Infinity, positive infinity. So that's the scale, zero, to infinity. I want to say to infinity and beyond. But, uh. <laughs> so well, how do I estimate the relative risk? It's, it, you do what you would expect. You put the hats on top of the parameters. So the estimated relative risk, notice how I have a hat on top of RR, is just pi hat 1 divided by pi hat 2. That's it. This is the MLE, maximum likelihood estimate. For those of you who have taken STAT 883, you might have heard the invariance property of maximum likelihood estimators. That's why this is the MLE. If you haven't heard of it, don't worry about it, just believe me, it's the MLE. So if that's the MLE then, remember, I have all these nice little properties of maximum likelihood estimators I can start using if I think of RR hat as a random variable. Because remember, all maximum likelihood estimators for a large sample have an approximate normal distribution with a mean that's essentially equal to the parameter that they're trying to estimate and a variance that's based upon then the, you know, the, uh, the second derivative log likelihood function. Okay? So I could use all that now to my benefit to try to find a confidence interval for the relative risk, just like what we did for a confidence interval for pi. So I could find, let's say this, relative risk hat plus or minus the value for my standard normal times the square root of the estimated variance of RR hat. Right? That's what I could do for a walled interval. Remember, we have issues with walled intervals. So instead, but one has, uh, what, what some research has shown is that don't use that interval. Instead, use some, something a little bit different. You might have seen in other places in statistics where if you take a transformation of a statistic and work with that transformation, you often get a better distributional approximation. Same thing happens here. So how about we instead work with the log of the relative risk? So let's find a confidence interval for the natural log of the relative risk first. How do I find that? Well, you know, use the same idea as we did up there. The estimator, plus or minus the value for my standard normal, 
times the square root of the estimated variance of that estimator. That's a walled interval for the log of RR. Of course, though, what do we really want? We don't care about the log of RR. We want RR itself. We want the relative risk itself. So, of course, if I take E, the exponential function, raised to the log RR power, what do I get? RR back. So let's do that here. Simply, we are going to use the exponential function with that interval that we just saw. And that's my interval for just the relative risk itself. How do I calculate this estimated variance that's in there? Here's the expression for it. Uh, this comes about for using what's called the delta method. Don't worry about the deprivation. Uh, if you're a stat major, let's take a look at Appendix B because the delta method is an extremely important um, tool in statistics. Um, what we're going to be concentrating on here in this class is just simply applying uh, this expression. Notice in this expression, I have w1 and w2, and they're in, the, in, the, in, in denominators. What would happen if you have zero successes for group one? Big time problems. So kind of as an ad hoc solution, what's often done is that you can, let's say, uh, use 0.5 for w1, if that were to, to occur. So let's, uh, let's apply this conference interval now to uh, a, a data set that we saw, I believe, last time or the time before, this polio vaccine clinical trial uh, data. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, so we are on page 73 and 74. So just a review of how I get my data into R. So again, I use the array function. I use the data argument with it. And I put my data in, do I put it in by columns or rows? I put it in by columns. So notice 57 and 142 is the first column in that uh, contingency table. Then I put in the second column. I know intuitively I want to put it in by rows, but this is just the way that this, this, is, this is set up. Then I specify my dimension, 2 by 2 table. The names for my dimension goes in my dim names argument. And if I put that on the C dot table, there is my contingency table. I'm going to find my pi dot hat dot table as well, where I take C table divided by um, N1 and N2, which comes about through using the row sums function. So the estimated probability of getting polio if you had the vaccine was 0 0.00028. I'm going to put pi hat 1 and pi hat 2 into their own um, uh, objects. Okay. So let's find the relative risk. It's very simple. Just take pi hat 1 divided by pi hat 2. I'm going to round to four decimal places. So I get 0.4024. So, vaccine was group one, placebo is group two. At least for our sample, which has the, the lower probability of getting polio? The vaccine. Okay. So, let's see, what do I have in the interpretation written there? Yeah, so this is on page 75. So the estimated probability of contracting polio is 0.4 times as large for individuals receiving the vaccine than those receiving the placebo. Notice how I added the word estimated from what we've had before for that interpretation. This is the same interpretation as what I was showing you before, but I added the word estimated because now I'm talking about my sample. Okay, please don't forget to do that. Now, another way that you can, you can look at this, too, is you can look at this from, from a standpoint of risk reduction. So if the vaccine group 
has a lower probability than the, uh, the placebo group. You might want to uh, kind of turn things around here. So we can see here that essentially I have a 60% reduction in the probability of getting polio by getting the vaccine versus the placebo. So I took 1 minus that 0.4 there. That's often. And in, these, in this kind of a setting, when you're comparing two different drugs and you don't want somebody to get that disease, that's often what's done. Let's talk about then the confidence interval. So first of all, I'm going to find N1 and N2 by just summing. Uh, I guess I could have done this a different way, but um, by summing row 1 and row 2 in my table, I'm going to set alpha to be 0 0.05 for a 95% interval. And then I simply pro program in my estimated variance of the log uh, uh, relative risk um, uh, expression that was given in the notes. Then I find my confidence interval where I use the EXP function to do the exponential part. The log there represents natural log. I find that. I round the four decimal places. And here is my interval, 0.3 to 0.55. So then my, my standard interpretation is with 95% confidence. Notice how I'm adding that portion now since I'm working with a confidence interval. The probability of contracting polio is between 0.3 and 0.55 times as large for those individuals receiving the vaccine than those individuals receiving the placebo. Please, uh, uh, that blue part there in my notes up here, uh, that was from uh, previous uh, version of these notes. I was revising it and I forgot to take it out. Notice I did not include the word estimated in this confidence interval um, interpretation because now we're talking about the true relative risk. That's why we have this certain level of confidence associated with it. Now, maybe those points are, are minor, but I see those kinds of mistakes often occurring for those who are new to statistics. That, you know, here I need to say the word estimated, and here I would not say the word estimated. Uh, again, you could turn things around by looking at a 45% to 70% risk reduction uh, by getting the vaccine. Now, in some settings, too, what you would like to do is maybe invert the, uh, the relative risk. So instead of doing pi 1 divided by pi 2, how about we just simply do pi 2 divided by pi 1? You know, it's kind of arbitrary what I put for row 1 and row 2. So you could do that as well. Now, all that you need to do in terms of the numerical computations is just take 1 over r, r hat. For the confidence interval itself, you just simply take 1 over the upper bound that you got before. That's your, going to be your new lower bound. And then 1 over the previous lower bound is going to be your new upper bound. Try it to see it. So which would you rather be in, the placebo group or the vaccine group? The vaccine group. Notice this confidence interval. Does it contain one? No. Okay. And remember what we said about relative risk equal to one means the two probabilities are the same. But this interval doesn't contain it. So, therefore, we have shown that this vaccine works in some respect, as what was done in the 1950s. Now, it's interesting in this particular problem. Uh, when I was writing my book, I actually went back to the original 1950s papers where this, this stuff was, was talked about. Uh, and they actually presented the clinical trial results. I mean, long, long papers um, associated with them. And, you know, it, it's interesting, too, that, you know, you know, you might expect a more dramatic reduction here. Because look at this. You know, after all, you know, 40, I'm sorry, 57 people who took the vaccine still got polio. Why? Um, I will just hypothesize here. I don't know if this is true, but based upon my experience with working up with other scenarios like this, this is why I expect to probably happen is that, you know, oftentimes people will be asymptomatic um, when they already, let's say, have, the, have a virus or some kind of infection in them. And so they won't know prior to the study, before they get 
you know, the, 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 the vaccine, uh, that they actually had the disease. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the reason why so many people still got polio. Another potential reason why is that, you know, the, 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 the vaccine that Salk developed is not the one that we actually use. There was a comp competing group of researchers who were also doing it. What Salk did, he, he used actually a, a, a live virus in the uh, vaccine, where this other group did not. And so there was a small chance that you could get polio from Salk's uh, vaccine. Small, small chance. Okay, so we are out of time here. What I would like you to do is read the Larry Bird example that I do next. This is not necessarily a case where I would do relative risk. You use relative risk when you have small probabilities that you're comparing. With Larry Bird, we don't have small probabilities. Um, also, and I was hoping to go over this in class, but we're out of time. Make sure you can answer these questions. Um, you can do it with respect to the polio example as well. Are there any questions? Okay, so I went over a minute or two, but you just get more for your money today. Uh, that is all, and I'll see you next time.